Hi guys, today we're going to start a new unit on work and energy. So, let's begin our energy and, or work and energy, energy and work. So, let's begin with uh, the definition of work. So, work is the transfer of energy from one form to another. So there's many different forms of energy. For example, we're going to be dealing with ki uh, kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy. And when you transform uh, energy from one form to another, that's when you are doing work. Now the general equation for work is equal to force times distance. Now this equation only works uh, for, we'll say only for constant forces. So if I was to um, look at the units here, obviously F stands for force, which has a unit of newtons, and D is distance, which has a unit of meters. And when you multiply them together, the unit is one newton meter. Now, we have a new name for this, and it's equal to one joule, and it's a capital J. So we'll write it out here. A newton meter, one newton meter is equal to one joule. So that is the unit of, of energy. And to kind of give you a sense of how much energy that is, so let's kind of move this over a little bit and kind of do an experiment here on our whiteboard. If we had a mass of, let's say, 100 grams, so that's one-tenth of a kilogram, um, maybe 100 grams would be the weight of uh, maybe like a small mandarin, something like that, okay? And you lift it a distance of, so by the way, how much force is this, right? So it's if it's 0.1 of a kilogram, therefore the force of gravity on that is going to be mg. So 0.1 times 9.8, that's going to give you approximately 1 newton. It's going to be about 9, uh, uh, 0.98, right? But 0.98 is approximately 1. So it's, a, it's not a heavy object, it's a very light object. But if we raise that object up to the top here, from here to here, by one meter, we will have done one joule of work. Okay? So one joule of work is not a lot of work. If I hold on to something like this pen is probably close to a uh, hundred grams, probably less than that. Um, but if I, maybe I would say perhaps maybe two or three of these pens would be about a hundred grams. So if I raised it 
up a meter, I would have done one joule of work. So uh, that kind of gives you a perspective as to how much it is. But please understand that this equation here only works when the force is constant. Now, as I lift the object, the force is constant. And the reason it's constant is because mg is constant. So the graph of this, the graph, what does this look like? Well, it looks like this. Here is the force, and here is the, oops, and here is the distance. Notice that this force is applied over this distance. Now, notice that this equation says force times distance. Well, here is the force, and here is the distance. What are we actually calculating by multiplying these two together? What we're actually doing is getting the area under the force versus distance graph. Therefore, the area under the graph is the actual true representation of the work done. The reason why I stress this is because if we were to change the force such that the force is no longer constant, notice here I said this is only for constant forces, Okay, well now, guess what? The force is not constant. So now, if we were to try and figure out what is the work done for a varying force that varies from zero all the way up to F, well, now the area under the graph is a triangle, and we know that the area of a triangle is base times height divided by 2. So in this case, the work done would be the base is D, the height is F, so we could say FD over 2. So really, we are not going to memorize this equation because it's a, for a very specific case. So what we can say for work is we're, we'll only remember this one, force times distance, and that works for all forces that are constant. But if the force is varying, we need to then figure out what the area under the graph is. And in, in, at this grade level, we can figure out what uh, a tri the area of a triangle, that's easy, and other simple uh, geometric shapes would be easy. But if the force is a function, then you would need integral calculus to, s to find the area under the curve. And that's beyond the scope of this course. Because that's, that's, that's what integral calculus does, is it allows you to determine the area under a graph, under a function. OK. Um, that's kind of just like looking ahead uh, into the future. But for now, let's now take a look at energy. Okay? So, what is energy? Okay. So, there are many different forms of energy. Uh, but the ones that were, you know, there's many different types of energy. There's uh, heat energy, and there's, which is the energy of uh, particles in motion in, in a solid or a liquid. But the ones we're going to focus on are gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy. So the first thing that we're going to state about energy is that. can't spell here. Energy is a conserved quantity. 
in a closed system. Now, this is actually a very important concept. What is this conserved quantity? Essentially, it means that your initial energy in a closed system, in other words, a closed system means that you cannot continue adding energy into a closed system and you cannot remove energy from a closed system. But the word conserved means this. It means that your initial energy will equal your total final energy. In other words, you cannot create or destroy energy. So now we have to take a look at what types of energy are there. Okay, so let's go with types of energy that we're going to look at. And the two types are gravitational potential energy and the other one is kinetic energy. So both of these have equations associated with them. And I'll write them now. Gravitational potential energy I'm going to call GPE. Some textbooks use different variables to represent this, but I like GPE because GPE are the first letters in gravitational potential energy. And gravity, remember, where does this come from? Uh, by the way, I'm not sure if I, if I wrote this before, but work and energy have the same units. So work and energy have the same <coughs> units. And that is joules. Okay? So remember what was the amount of work done or the amount of energy necessary to lift something well it's force times distance well if we're lifting it that means we have to go we have to work against gravity and what is the force of gravity it's mg and the distance we lift it is the height h so it's force times distance where the force is mg and the distance is h where in this case this h represents height above the ground and that's in and that's in meters okay so that that does give us the correct units remember it's new uh, a, a joule is a newton meter so mg is going to give you newtons and h is going to give you meters then the other uh equation for kinetic energy will say ke and that's going to equal one half mv squared now I'm not going to try and derive that equation. I'm just going to give it to you and say, there it is. And uh, we will need to memorize that equation. It's not a difficult equation to memorize. But here's what I want you to understand. Let me, obviously I think you know what M stands for. M is mass, just as it is in above. And V does indeed stand for velocity. <coughs> But let me draw a graph here with gravitational potential energy versus height above the ground. Notice that this graph is going to be a straight line where, well, that's as straight of a line as I could draw. But essentially, 
m and g here in this equation are constants. The mass doesn't change. The gravitational attraction of the Earth doesn't change. And so therefore, as you increase the height, the gravitational potential energy increases linearly. So they're proportional to each other, which makes sense. And that's pretty, uh, pretty uh, obvious, I would say. But look at kinetic energy. If I plot kinetic energy versus velocity, now the mass is constant. That's fine. The 1 half is a constant. But notice kinetic energy is now proportional to the square of velocity. Now, what does this graph look like? It's not linear. It's a square. It's a curve. That means when you increase the velocity, you don't increase the kinetic energy an equivalent amount. It's the square. So if you, if you let's say, you double the velocity, that means you get 2 squared. That's four times the amount of kinetic energy, not double the kinetic energy. If you triple the velocity, you don't get three times the kinetic energy. You get nine times the kinetic energy because 3 squared is 9. So you understand now that kinetic energy is heavily weighted on velocity because it's a square function, not a linear relationship. So that's kind of an important aspect to remember about kinetic energy. Now, let's go back to this equation here, which states that initial energy equals final energy. That's conservation. If we rewrite that equation and we say, hey, uh, oops, messed that up there. Let me fix that. There we go. If we now say that the two types of energy that we're going to deal with are gravitational and gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy, then we can rewrite this equation like this. We can say GPE initial plus KE initial equals GPE final plus KE final. You see, now what we've done is we recognize that we could have two different types of energy and we have stated the initial value for each of them and the final value of for each of them and the sums should be the same. In other words, the amount of energy in one could could change and the some of the energy could be shifted or moved over to another form, but the total should still remain the same. Now, if we write down the equations that each of these is equal to, watch what we get. This is mgh initial height plus k, or sorry, that's wrong, plus 1 half mv initial squared is equal to mgh final plus 1 half mv final squared. So notice this, if I was to give you this equation first, it would look quite complicated, or at least it might seem daunting to some students. But in fact, it is simply the conservation of energy. Every, every form of energy, which we have in these two forms, here and here, we simply add them up initially and set them equal to their sum in their final conditions. So. It's not really a complicated equation at all. And in fact, in many situations, you know, some of these terms might tend to zero, depending on the question. But this is the general form of that. The one thing I did uh, forget to mention is what are the, the meanings of gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy? So. Gravitational potential energy is the energy stored 
in an object as it is raised. above the ground. And the reason why it has stored energy is because it has the potential to fall down. This is actually the energy that hydroelectric dams use because the sun will evaporate water from the ocean, right? Which so if I if I draw you a little image of this if if you know if here is the ocean and the sun rays evaporate the water and the water evaporates up and comes up to the sky and forms clouds then the clouds rain and the water goes downhill on a mountain and then you can have a dam and as the water flows through the dam you can generate hydroelectric power. And that is the concept that energy is stored in an object as it is raised above the ground because it has the potential to fall back down. Gravity will pull it down. It takes work to raise something up. And that work that you do can be released as it falls back down. So that's kind of an explanation uh, with an example for gravitational potential energy. On the other hand, kinetic energy, Ke, that is simply the energy of an object in motion. So, kinetic means motion and it is the whenever something is moving it has energy it takes energy to move something and we're, like as I said we're not going to go into the derivation of the, the the equation one half mb squared but it is enough to um, it's enough to know that as an object moves faster and faster, it has more and more energy, and that energy is directly uh, proportional to the square of its velocity. Okay, so that's 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 the simple kind of explanation of what is kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy. Okay. So from here, we'll kind of stop here and uh, we'll move forward uh, in a bit. So the last part of this lesson, I'm going to introduce the, the work energy theorem. And the work energy theorem states, it's kind of, it's like another form of this conservation of energy uh, equation. They're both good and you can use either one, but the work energy theorem states that the net work done on an object is equal to the change in its kinetic energy. So essentially that's like a, uh, it's like a work energy theorem equation. So if I wrote it out, I could say, the network, oops, didn't write that correctly. The network done on an object is equal to the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy. Okay? So we'll stop there and um, we'll take a look at some examples of these in the example problems in the next lesson.